So the blood is etherized in the heart of all individuals, but it can be etherized or transformed in the image of love or fear. The heart has potential to imbue our blood with the essence of Christ in the etheric plane, which in turn evolves our entire form. If one cannot attune their heart to Christ, then the etherized process will work against them and solidify their devolution. All right. So in my analysis, I see us at, at definitely being in a, an initiation point. And I think that where we are in society and where we are overall in our evolution as human beings is that we can go into our heart and evolve, truly evolve with the sun, with the earth, with the cosmos as we're supposed to, or I believe that we can devolve. And I believe that we can become held back. And I believe that we can even begin to connect into what I would call the inorganic timeline or the divergent stream of, of mankind. So what I see is that we have two futures ahead of us. One is organic and one is in many ways synthetic or divergent. And um, I'll link the lectures where I talk about this below. And the, the sort of catalyzing fact around this is whether or not you can understand the Christ impulse in humanity um, and its power in your own system and understand the heart. That is what defines everything. And that's what actually allows you to begin to build out a higher form for yourself, but also just a better life that's more in tune with nature, with God. And so over time, the earth and sun and cosmos will evolve and we can kind of evolve with it or not. And the earth will spiritualize into a higher density. Um, and there's going to be certain individuals who may not be able to completely make that spiritualization. They may not be able to uh, evolve with the earth and the sun. And if we cannot make this evolution, I see that as being essentially becoming trapped in the eight sphere. I think that all of these divergent um, streams or the ultimately the divergent form of the human will eventually get sucked into what is called the eight sphere. And I will also link some of those videos below, but I think many of you understand what the eight sphere is. It is a completely false backwards um, realm that's around the earth. And it acts as this catch-all for forces that cannot attune to the Christ impulse. And then it begins to sort of create its own world. And then over time, our world, our earth, commingles with the eight sphere in a, in, in a much more physical way than we could ima maybe imagine. And this happens through technology, through the electrification of the earth and through um, basically frequencies, discordant, unnatural frequencies. This allows the eighth sphere to really manifest itself. And um, this is where we get the idea of the Antichrist and the, the incarnation of the Antichrist. All of this is all about the eighth sphere. It's all pointing us towards understanding what the eighth sphere is. And then eventually over time, we will split away and we will separate and the eighth sphere will be sucked downwards deeper and deeper and deeper and kind of backwards. Um, and then the earth will begin to kind of astralize itself into Jupiter. But until we reach, we're going to go through a pretty crazy period of time where we need to know that these two evolutionary paths exist and what they represent and we need to understand how we spiritualize ourselves. You know, ascension, spiritualization, I mean, we need to know exactly how it works, right? And so that is what this lecture, I hope, has conveyed to you from maybe many different angles. 
And the last thing I want to talk about a little bit tying into the last lecture that I did is um, Armand and Lucifer. So Armand and Lucifer, and by the way, this is, I want to just make it clear that this is my analysis and this is my uh, vision on this. This is not, this is using anthroposophy, but this is not something that Steiner said. This is something that I have seen myself with my own clairvoyant visions and work using the Steiner system. Okay, so I see that Armand and Lucifer um, are also connected to the etherization of our blood or how energies circulate through our system. And what I saw in my own vision was that as our energy is being circulated, if we circulate it through our heart and with the Christ impulse, it actually goes to Christ. And then Christ sets it almost on fire, spiritual fire, um, and or he catalyzes it and gives it back to us. And then we can go and catalyze our form with that. And then I and then I saw that if that is not done, then the, the process still goes on in a more mechanical fashion. But without Christ in our heart, what ends up happening is that Lucifer and Armon end up receiving and siphoning that energy and it passes to them. But Lucifer and Armon don't give that energy back to you. They don't do any transformation with it because they're not capable of doing that. And so what ends up happening is they actually rest that information, that energy out of you and away from you. They, they, they take a piece of the mineral substance of the blood away from you. And that goes in towards building the eight sphere. And that goes towards them feeding themselves. So we are going through this process where our blood is being transformed in our system. And because it's being transformed, because there's that process of alchemy going on, there's always little mineral essences that are being changed around this part of our body from one form to another. Now, when we have Christ in our heart, we get that energy back in a higher form. And that can then go into our head, as I mentioned, and it becomes spiritualized and cycles through. And that's actually how we heal and become inspired and all of that. But if we cannot have Christ in our heart, it's not just that we become selfish and egotistical and all this kind of stuff. It is also that two very real individuals that are just as real as Christ in the etheric, these individuals also stand there. And if you can't, if it doesn't go through Christ, it defaults to them. And they take that mineral substance that should be etherized through Christ. They take that themselves and they create the eighth sphere with it and they feed on it. So this is something that we also have to understand. And this is why there's almost, this is why there's that imagery of vampires who are feeding on the essence of the blood, they're feeding on the blood. This represents Aramon and Lucifer that are taking that mineral essence that's kind of like a little bit of a, um, that's part of our inner, How it, it, it happens when we do that etherization and these shifts in our being when it goes from an ether form to an astral form and all this kind of stuff. It's a little bit of burn off and they take that mineral essence, that etheric mineral essence, but they don't give it back it goes into the eight sphere. And what ends up happening is that at that point, it's like there's a little piece of yourself in the eight sphere. Um, and the learning situation from this is we're supposed to recognize that, um, look at it and essentially, you know, reclaim these aspects of us that are, or, or transform them. Right. So, um, when we so there is a circulation of life force outside our system and it can go through Christ and link us to a higher evolutionary system 
or it can go into Arman and Lucifer and go into the eighth sphere. So I want to make this super, super crystal clear. When our heart is attuned to Christ, as our blood passes into the heart for etherization, it passes through Christ in the etheric. Christ then gives it back in a higher condition so that we may transform ourselves as he did. When our heart is not attuned to Christ, Armon and Lucifer stand where Christ would. Instead of receiving a higher substance to transform ourselves with, Lucifer and Armon rested away into the eight sphere to create the eight sphere and as food for themselves. So let's see what Steiner has said on this. He says, Mark this well. Instead of pure imaginations being there in the eighth sphere, the imaginations are densified by the infusion of a mineral element that has been wrested from the earth. Densified imaginations are thus created. They are ghosts, specters, that is to say, behind our world, there is a world of specters created by Lucifer and Armon. So that essence that they're taking from our bodies, from our, from our soul essence, can also be seen as like imaginations or thought energy or thought forms. And so that's how it's being described here. And then he continues. Lucifer and Armon have their being have Lucifer and Armon have been the most successful in wresting away substantiality in the so-called noblest organ of man, the head. They have been able to wrest away the greatest amount of mineralized substantiality. This alchemy by which mineral substance is sent over into the eighth sphere is taking a place, is taking place all the time behind the scenes of our existence. So again, they're resting away all that unrefined mineral substance that we're not able to transmute within our being. We're not able to bring it into the heart. We're not able to develop the heart. So that gets rested away into this lower plane and we become more and more connected to it and more and more trapped in it. And the more that we participate in this, the more, the more obsessed we become with the intellect, the more we think the soul doesn't even exist. How could we sense anything other than ourselves if our heart is not developed? We don't believe in Christ. We don't believe in in the personification of the cosmos, we don't believe that any human being could take on the power of the sun to any degree. All of these things become abstract stories or myths that never really happened. Have you noticed that? The life of Christ becomes this myth that we just created, but it never ever becomes something that we do. It, there, there, there's never any real action to take and we never understand the action in our system that is because of him or because of that, that solar force within us. So we start to separate ourselves from the truth of our heart and from the truth of the sun. And we get no alchemy. We only get ourselves slowly being pulled apart and sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into the eighth sphere or the lower astral plane. If everything were to run without a hitch for Lucifer and Armon, if they were everywhere able to rest as much as they rest from the organ of the head, earth evolution would soon reach a point where Lucifer and Armon could succeed in destroying our earth and in leading over all evolution of worlds into the eighth sphere. So that the eighth sphere evolution as a whole would take a different course. Now this is the battle 
between good and evil. This is the battle between Christ and Lucifer and Armand. This is why we have to find that balance in our heart. Hence, Lucifer endeavors to, hold, to unfold his greatest strength of all at the place where man is the most vulnerable, namely his head. So they can't get into the heart. They can't connect with it because the solar furnace of Christ is our heart. So they have to sort of hang out around the body, namely the head, and try to rest away whatever they can this sort of lower quality mineral substance that is being etherized in the heart, but it's not with Christ in it. They, they rest that away. And I chose that. I chose these pieces to read because it becomes very clear in reading those passages that Christ works through the heart at this time and the heart communicates with the head. It uh, brings higher Christ and forces into the head, but Christ is in, in the etheric, which is in our heart, and the sun, which is in our heart. Um, and Armand and Lucifer are hanging out in the head, trying to siphon off whatever they can. Once something has not occurred, they can try to do that. Um, and so what I also saw with this was that the future human form or the divergence um, human form ends up essentially totally devolving and the head actually sort of begins to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and what it, and and this is because there's no real transformation going on in the system to keep the form evolving properly and, and keep it balanced. So what ends up happening is there's so much head activity without the heart there to balance it, um, that the head just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and the, and it becomes all about the intellect, a very cold calculated intellect. And then eventually, um, the glands also end up failing in the body reproduction stops and hum human beings eventually begin to degenerate. And this is why a lot of, um, it's funny because as I was seeing this, this potentially devolved form of humanity that will eventually one day form um, because they were unable to evolve properly. Um, I, I thought about the Wizard of Oz, you know how the, the Wizard of Oz has that huge head and also gray aliens have these huge heads. And I, and this to me is, is an ex why we are having so many experiences with, I would say, gray beings is that it's mirroring this to us. And also a lot of other strange beings that are essentially just trapped within the eighth sphere. They're really representing an aspect of ourself that needs to be healed. And um, I'll probably get into this in a future lecture, exactly what the false cosmos is, when it began and all this kind of stuff that we need to get into, because I do wanna go very, very deeply into what I call the false cosmos or the eight sphere and all of the beings in there. But I wanna get into your question, so I will save that for another lecture. But suffice to say, the lower astral plane, the eighth sphere, the false cosmos, the one defining thing about all those beings is that there is no heart center developed. And when you're doing your spiritual work and you're sensing um, whether something's, you know, what is going on, um, a being that is evolutionarily advanced or just, you know, able to work with Christ or, or able to be, um, is, is, is essentially more of a human or more of a compassionate being is going to have a heart field. Um, and then beings in the eighth sphere that are very dark, they don't, they lose the heart development entirely. And they try to make that up through extreme intellectualism. And that impulse of Armon and Lucifer together in the eighth sphere also pushes them towards transhumanism. It pushes them towards uh, genetic modification and external hybridization and 
they begin to try to evolve their form physically because they never accept the Christ impulse within them and within their heart and the process of spiritualization and etherization with Christ that actually evolves the form. They never accept that. They never see it. They deny it. But then they reach a point where their form begins to degenerate. Um, and they begin to say, well, the only way that we can survive is by, you know, completely hybridizing ourselves with other beings or other, other with, with, uh, with animals, um, with people who are etherizing their blood properly, who are able to maintain their humanity. Um, there's a whole lot of information that it is time that we talk about um, in the mystical community that involves what happens when human beings uh, do not evolve naturally. What happens when human beings cannot ascend, when they cannot change their form through the solar furnace of the heart? What happens exactly to humanity when we do not do that? Exactly what happens to us? What happens when it when, when that divergent path is, is, is taken on? And this is what we really need to start thinking about because that is where we're going to get a lot of answers in regards to a lot of things that are going to happen in society in the future. A lot of, you know, alien forms or things are going to be presented and it really is more to do with humanity's devolved timeline than beings from the stars. And so we need to start understanding this. We need to start understanding that the solar system is a school. And so this is going to prepare us. This kind of information is going to prepare us for the years to come. So ascending spiritualization, it doesn't have to be mysterious. It doesn't have to be vague. It doesn't have to be something that I'm in 5D and you're in 4D and you're in 3D and all this kind of bizarre stuff that doesn't actually really teach us anything. Now, this is a science. It's a spiritual science. Human evolution in the solar system is a spiritual science or a mystery science. We do not have to have vague information. The information is there and it has been with us for thousands of years. Yes, we do have to upgrade um, the wisdom as we get these great masters that come and do these phenomenal rites that change the environment of the earth. For sure we do. But it is time also that we start to understand these things very exactly and very specifically. Um, we have to go very deep into these understandings now. So we are active participants in the spiritualization of our form in our ascension. And we do this through working with Christ in our hearts. And when we do this, we evolve with the solar system, with the earth and with the sun and with each other. All right, I'm going to go right into your questions. What have you got for me? Okay. All right. So I won't be... Um, I won't be naming any of your names because this will be going on YouTube. So you're going to have to listen for your question. Okay. Could you please explain the difference between perception of Christ in dogmatic and esoteric Christianity? Um, I would say that there's different perceptions of Christ in different churches and different individuals have different ideas of it. But fundamentally, dogmatic Christianity does not include the deeper esoteric realities of Christ and uh, of Jesus, of his life. Um, at this point in time, what we call dogmatic religion is basically heavily redacted and heavily reduced um, spiritual scriptures that quite honestly, um, are many times armonic and have nothing of the real Christ essence in them. 
I mean, the whole talk that we did today, which is um, inspired from Anthroposophy and from the Steiner work, I mean, that is not a sermon that you're going to hear at the church down the street. Um, and this is the problem of our evolution at this time is we're becoming mechanical or harmonic about spiritual ideas that should be transcendental in nature. You know, when you go to listen to a preacher preach or a spiritual teacher teach, I mean, you should be transformed. The information should be hitting you on so many different levels of your being. Um, it should be valid. It should be super useful. Um, and it should be timely. It should represent the initiations of this time. But that's not what we see often in dogmatic religions. And unfortunately, uh, there's even things that are quite honestly satanic going on in dogmatic religions. Um, and also... So many books were taken out of, out of the Bible. Um, and we're going to have a new type of um, Christianity. We're going to have a new type of spirituality, actually, that's going to come forward um, and arise. And it's going to be connected with spiritual science. Because everything that I was talking today about Christ's sacrifice in his life, that was a massive ritual on behalf of humanity, on behalf of the sun. It's a very intense and beautiful rite. And, and quite frankly, there's so many people who are naturally spiritual. They think spiritual. They think in energy. They think in souls. They think in higher, in higher terms. And those people, and there's more and more of them being born every day, those people are not going to relate at all to dogmatic Christianity at all that's just not gonna they're not gonna make sense to them it's just gonna be like a weird dead corpse of a teaching but when they begin to understand uh what a master is what a spiritual master is what spiritual initiation is in our solar system what the spirit of the earth is and the earth's many different incarnations and human evolution. This is the real teaching. This is the real, this is the real thing. It's the real deal. It, it allows you to function independently as well. Right? So there are so many differences between dogmatic Christianity and esoteric Christianity. In a lot of ways, it's, it's not even recognizable. Um, Steiner also talks about this a lot in his work. Um, about how a lot of, not just Christianity, but a lot of religions are, are dogmatic at this point and harmonic. And the way through that is releasing religion and again, developing spiritual science or occult science, mystery science. And we don't have to have stories and fables and things like this. We can actually, we do have the power now at this stage of evolution to intellectually, rationally understand how energy works. And moving forward in the future, the human being becomes the greatest technology. Being human is the greatest technology and everything that's done externally is actually an internal feat that we can do. And that is the real direction we are going. But in order to do that, we have to clarify um, we have to clarify Christ. We have to understand what the Christ impulse is, what the Christ stream is, how it evolves on the planet, how it had peaked with Jesus. Um, we have to understand what that right was about. All of this stuff needs to be taught properly and understood properly. And then we'll begin, begin to get into the science of initiation and all of these deeper topics and truly evolve. Right. You know, religion doesn't really offer us that. Right. So we're, we're, that's an old phase. It's, it's like an old phase of humanity just hanging on. How does the etherization of the blood affect or impact the way in which Lucifer and Armon relate to human beings? Does the etherization neutralize their impact on us or does it have some other impact on our ability to transmute our energy for our soul consciousness and development. Yes. So um, 
I covered that in the last portion of the lecture, but um, we're always sort of interacting with higher beings, if you will. And because Armon and Lucifer, their essence was part of the formation of the cosmos and the earth, the energy that they're taking on, just like, uh, you know, how Christ is taking on the impulse of the sun and of evolution. Well, you can see, you can think that Lucifer and Armon at their current state is also taking on an impulse, which is devolution in just different ways. It's imbalanced. And so without Christ in our heart, we end up running our energy through Lucifer and Armon first. Um, and that leads to the degeneration of our system. Um, when we run our energy through our heart, um, we run it through the etheric Christ. And as the etherization takes place in our heart, because it's aligned with Christ, um, we spiritualize our form more and more and more. Um, if it's not spiritualized with Christ, again, it's going to move through, in my opinion, Lucifer and Armon, and that is going to be wrested away and turned into the eighth sphere, or it goes into the lower astral plane. And this is why also, um, you know, uh, there's an element when we die where we sort of have to confront the aspects of ourself that have been wrested away into the eighth sphere, the thought forms that we've had. Um, and the times where we could not be in our heart, we have to confront those. They don't just disappear, you know, life after life after life. We have to, um, you know, we have to evolve. Okay. How does the attained degree of etherization of our blood in one life affect our potential to etherize our blood in our next lives? Also, does the etherization of blood uh, have any associations with Aurora Borealis? Okay, good question. So it does, um, the etherization does actually work in uh, life after life after life. Um, so I mentioned earlier how uh, spiritual masters have this beautiful glowing almost solar aura. Um, and that's because life after life, they were able to um, essentially uh, spiritualize themselves. Um, and so really, I really think that, well, ultimately, so the death process is also not a mystery. <laughs> uh, we know how we know what our death process is. Again, this is, I talked about this in prior Q and A's and in videos before. Um, when we go through a death process, it's sort of like a um, amelioration or everything kind of gets separated out. And the aspect of ourself that we have been able to transform through Christ, that gets sort of put aside almost kind of like the fruit of our labor. And we carry that with us as we kind of move through the cosmos in our decompression process after death. And then there's also like the dross or the darker things that exist within our soul that we couldn't heal, that we couldn't overcome. And those stay in the lower planes around the planet. And that is actually what makes us have to reincarnate when we go through. And so um, this is why I was saying in my, you know, suicide video that it is very dangerous for different spiritual teachers to say that, you know, suicide doesn't matter and it doesn't end and this kind of dream world that various different people kind of create, it, it's like, no, there's a very real amelioration or, or, or process that takes place where whatever we don't transform in this life is left there. We take it on again. And so we really want to use every life to try to transform as much as possible um, so that we can evolve out of this plane, right? And we, we only, to my knowledge, we only get a certain amount of, we're on a time where we live from epoch to epoch. It's not, we're not living permanently in the same condition, the condition changes. 
So we, it's not what people want to hear, um, but it's, this is the science of the spirit and it allows us to be more conscious and more mature um, in our understanding of this. Um, so um, the, I'm not sure. I've never thought about the etherization of the blood um, and Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis is to do with um, the magnetic um, essence of the earth and obviously um, the spirit of the earth and obviously Christ's blood does go into this, the, the, the spirit of the earth. <laughs> and uh, so I, so maybe there could be some connection because obviously his blood did change the earth. Maybe it changed the, the energetic field and made it, made the, makes the color green, like the heart chakra. I'm not sure. I've never actually looked into it, but it's a really good question. Okay. Steiner seems to be referring to the physical heart in the etherization process, but I'm not sure. What is the connection between the physical and spiritual heart? Does etherization happen in the physical heart? Then Christ merges from the spiritual heart. So um, it's not really seen in the Steiner work. Um, you know, the physical heart is not really seen as separate or different from the spiritual bodies. Um, they're seen as interwoven and interrelating with each other. To view them as completely separately would be harmonic. So he's definitely talking about the physical heart. Um, but when he talks about something etherizing, he's talking about an alchemical transformation of something that is mineral into a finer form or into an etheric form and flipping like a figure eight into an etheric realm and then cycling through just like when he's talking about, um, the brain and the pineal gland and the pituitary gland. Um, it's not just a physical gland. Like it's not just the pineal gland that is, you know, producing melatonin and regulating our rhythms and our hormones. Like that's one level of it. The pineal gland is also a zero point. It's also, um, doing all of this work with subtle energies and an anthroposophy, um, the, uh, the more spiritual function of the organ is included in it. It's not seen as separate. Um, and the etheric body is sort of like, um, it's a good way to look at it is sort of like the in-between between the totally spiritual cosmic astral and the totally physical physical. Um, and so, you know, like when we have our chakra system, it, it's like the chakra system is piercing into the etheric body, right? So there's a chakra, there's a chakra there, and then there's a physical heart, and there's this complete interplay where spirit is matter and matter is spirit, but we don't really see it. But we use it all the same to catalyze ourselves into a higher form. So um, uh, he's definitely referring to the physical heart. Um, but he also describes the heart as being um, as functioning differently than like medicine would today. Um, and etherization, you know, by definition means there's a loss there's a change in state. There's a change in condition. Specifically, it is uh, switching into the etheric body. Um, and this gets into not just the physical blood of our body, but the subtle fields that follow the blood and the subtle energies, um, which are totally connected to the physical form and are kind of uh, interacting with it, if that makes sense. So um, etherization begins and definitely has an element that is physical, but by definition, the word etherization is suggesting something transcendental is occurring. 
Otherwise, why mention ether? Why mention etherizing? It's a alchemical transformation that's happening because of the solar energy in our heart um, and the essence of Christ. It's actually um, a spiritual, etheric, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a, it's, it's, I think that process is more unseen, obviously, because even in his drawings, you can, like, I mean, when you're looking at someone, you're not seeing the newly etherized substance streaming like this to the heart. You know, you're not seeing it do that. Um, you know, so it, it is definitely physical. There's physical elements, but again, in, in, in anthroposophical medicine and, and things like that, it's, it's not, they're not seen as separate. Okay. So Christ is in the spirit of the earth. Christ is in the etheric body of the earth. Um, and so when we go into our heart, there's a flipping of our bioenergetic field into it's part of it begins to connect with the etheric spirit of the earth and Christ is there waiting. And so by understanding him and knowing him um, and filling ourselves with knowledge and, and, and practices that reflect his teachings, and then we're able to magnify that to us. Okay. And then it goes to catalyze our form. So it's really more of a spiritualized process, but it's, it's, uh, um, it's not fully separate. In Italy, the Madonna is often portrayed with the etherized halo. Is this a reference to the exalted female? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Black Madonna is hearkening back to the very more uh, ancient or older um, cults um, of the feminine. And this has to do with more of the mysteries of Mary um, and the feminine, with, which also exist in Christianity in Christianity in its original pure form, um, those were taken out and it was really whittled down to a couple small books. Um, on one hand, to keep people focused on certain things, but as we move into the age of Aquarius and as we move into the next level, we're going to need to bring that feminine impulse back in. We're gonna to need to bring in the Mary mysteries and the feminine aspect of the Christ impulse because this mystery overall cannot be known unless she is there. So there's again, a, there's a point with even the Christ impulse and the Christ stream that simply cannot develop any further until um, the uh, Mary is understood, the mysteries of Mary and the mysteries of the feminine are understood. So we, we will be getting more into that into the future as well. Okay, you speak of Jesus's work on the earth for three years before his death. I assume you're talk, you talking the three years after his baptism. Do our baptisms now mean anything more than what the mainstream Christianity understands? Yes, I am talking about um, the three years after his baptism. The Basically, the final three years of his life from 30 to 33 is what I'm talking about. Um, and that's when he took on the spirit of the sun. And so, um, yeah, well, I, the process of baptism was a little different um, before Christ. So essentially, once Christ was able to transform himself, his blood and offer it into the earth, changing the etheric body of the earth, um, everything changed at that moment. Everything changed definitely at that moment because the energy of the earth was catalyzed into a higher frequency. And um, because it had the sun doing it on one end, pulling it up and changing it, and then they had the mineral and, and the, the human level doing it with his blood on the other end. 
And so that totally changed the earth. And that means that humanity was also quietly changed as well, or had the option to change. So when you look at the rites and the rituals that are pre-Christian, they're not going to function the same way after Christ. And there's a part in um, the Steiner work where um, he mentions that um, there were sort of what ends up happening is the earth is like is moving forward in its evolution um almost like a comet moving forward and then all of the traditions and and things have to be upgraded all uh, at certain points when there's like an impulse um and so if you stay to in the past what ends up happening is the deities and the sort of energies and the rituals actually become possessed because the Christ impulse is no longer in that time. It's no longer animating that consciousness. It's like you're staying too far in the past. And super ancient things, a lot of people think, well, the more old it is, the more pure it is ritually or magically. And that's not actually the case. We're always evolving and it's more about having the ideologies um, and the understandings and the rituals and stuff that are correct for our form. Now, really what happens after the incarnation of Christ is we kind of work upon ourselves. That's really the whole thing. It sort of solidifies our eye, it solidifies our individuality, and then we work upon ourselves. Before Christ, um, there, it was really more about like a high priest um, imbuing things into you. And so there's a period um, really before Christ and even going up to Christ where that was still done more so, where it was really more about a high priest or a very advanced initiate kind of bringing you through a certain initiation, right? And giving you the potential to do something. And it was more external. And so some of the rites were done in more of an external way. Now, the earth was already preparing to turn inward, and Christ did that um, as it was turning. Um, so um, we have to understand that it, it's kind of like there's a slow shift going on. So really the work for us is to understand um, consciousness um, uh, the spiritual worlds again, as a science. And we use our, and we use that to work upon ourselves to spiritualize ourselves. That's the biggest thing. It's not that baptisms and things don't work. There definitely are, are a lot of things that can be effective. Um, but the emphasis isn't as much on that as it used to be, um, in the past. Does this make sense? So your baptisms definitely mean things, you know, it's, purifying the astral body. Um, there's lots of rites and rituals that still have meaning, that still have pull, but they don't have the same pull that they used to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, or even a couple thousand years ago. Because again, our form is evolving, our planet is evolving, our cosmos is evolving, and it's not the same. Okay, so... Um, yeah. It's really, it's really so much more. I can't stress it enough is that our task is not really to be imbued by other beings with any special qualities or have another individual, um, work upon our etheric body or work upon our astral bodies or, do these kinds of things. That's really more about what our evolution was like in the past when we needed, we needed these high priests and things to uh, guide us or actually make changes to our bodies or imbue us with things. I really can't stress enough that where we are now is where all of that is more of an internalized process. And that happened in the Greco-Roman era and we have to really catalyze ourselves. Um, and start to do this all upon ourselves, And that is what the kingdom of heaven means. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't have really powerful 
connections with the cosmos and rights and, and things like this. It doesn't mean that. It just means that that is not the main way we evolve anymore. Okay. It's like when Christ incarnated, um, um, that represented a distinct change in the earth, which is why he did it at the exact time he did, because the earth needed someone to take on that burden and it needed an individual to be able to do that transformation on for humanity on her behalf. She needed that. Um, and so... It just it, it 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 changes things from there on out. I hope that makes sense. It brought things inward. The work is inside now, um, and that's why when you look at individuals and the divergent stream of humanity that has not made that shift inward, and they think that you can you can still evolve through materialization. Um, you can still evolve by working externally upon the individual. It used to be the case that you had to evolve because a priest or somebody actually worked upon you. They actually would insert something into your etheric field or do a shift and they would be imbued with an angelic force and there would be real things like that that would occur that would be initiations and mystery schools. It was really working upon you, imbuing you with things. Right. But then again, after Christ, after the, the earth was already changing and Christ just took on the impulse and 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 served that purpose. But there's still people um, around that don't understand it. The music has changed. It's a different rhythm, but they're still dancing to the old tune. And they think that they need to add things to themselves, to their bodies in order to evolve. They need to change their form. They need to change their being, except now it's not they need to change their etheric form in some way or have some in energy introduced to their etheric form. Now they think they need to add like a computer chip or they need to do this or that. But it's all this impulse, this past impulse of externalized focus where they don't realize it's from within now. We, 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 we evolve from inside out now. And yes, it is different than even 3,000 years ago. We didn't evolve this way 3,000 years ago. We were preparing ourselves for. We were beginning to our. We, we, we were beginning to train for it, and the Earth was beginning to shift to that moment. But it hadn't yet sunken in. But now we've had the incarnation 2,000 years ago, and now we're moving into our spiritualization, our ascension. So we have to actually work upon ourselves. Does this make sense, you guys? This total shift in how we live and how we evolve? That's why, you know, there's in, in this mystery, they're saying, you know, the Christ essence is in the earth. It's inside of us. The solar force is within us and we use it to heal and transform within. And that actually changes and creates a new etheric form for us over time, which is ascension because we're literally no longer in the material plane when we do this. So I hope this makes sense. What does it feel like to you when your heart begins to etherize the blood? Do you feel any sensation? Yeah, so um, when you begin to focus on your heart and your heart opens and develops and you align it with Christ, a lot of the times you'll begin to feel um, the body relax, um, your energy will begin to harmonize. So um, that means that you may feel warm sensations, you may feel certain sensations in your, in your body. Um, and it's sort of like, I guess, an adaptogen energetically, like it'll, it'll just put, it'll begin to put you in harmony. And usually there's a feeling of peace, relaxation. Usually that happens, though, when you've been doing it for a long time. You're aware of the process. You're aware of Christ. Then you can begin to feel what it's like when that essence is in your body and when it's not. Um, and that's something that we all have to practice. Um, and then the other sign that it's going on is creativity. Um, in anthroposophy, it's very clear that 
one of the things that really impressed Steiner about the process of etherizing the blood with Christ in your heart is that when that essence goes up into the head, it's an exalted essence. And so it ends up um, attracting high astral forces. So the, the, it's not going into the lower astral, the eighth sphere and pulling that in. It's actually pulling in genuine higher cosmic brilliance. And you get new ideas, you get genius, you, you become creative, um, your body can regenerate because you're cycling through um, information that's not, you, you, you're cycling through and you're renewing yourself through the Christ essence in your heart because your heart, again, is reaching into the etheric because your heart naturally etherizes your blood, okay? What are your thoughts on food choices affecting our blood? For example, the difference between consuming flesh of, a, flesh of an animal exposed, exposed, opposed to the flesh of a fruit. One requires a hunt, the other a harvest. Is there something to be explored here? Um, there really is not an answer for one individual. This is the thing about diet. This is the thing is, is that there is no one answer for everyone. And I think if we approach it with the line of thinking that there is, we're only going to be very confused and angry because we're going to be repeatedly encountering individuals that have a different approach. And um, ultimately, there are different types of individuals uh, with different constitutions. And so some people actually need to have uh, meat and animal products in their diet. It has to do with uh, grounding them and um, certain aspects of their constitution. And then some people um, can have less. Um, some people have none. And it's actually not, that's actually not going to decide whether or not you're a spiritual person or not. It doesn't decide whether you're better than someone or not. Everybody is coming from a different place, a different point of, of evolution. Um, and so um, one requires a hunt, the other a harvest. Um, I, is there anything to be explored there? I mean, when it comes to what we're talking about today with Christ in our heart, ultimately, you know, the more that you open your heart, and you understand this teaching, the more you're going to be drawn to the exact diet that works for you. And also, the more you're going to understand that everybody is different. Um, and that everybody else is going to be drawn to the way of diet that works for them as well. And so when we're truly in our heart, we understand, we understand this kind of beautiful unfolding that we all go through. And uh, there, there really isn't any judgment there or anything. It's just more about you tuning into your heart and figuring out what works for you. And uh, that's the but that's the best thing that you can do. All right, well, the etherization of our blood change our physical form. What about other animals or plants? Well, the animals and plants are definitely going through their own evolution and they're connected right in with the earth and the spirit of the earth. And they would have received the Christ impulse as well in some way, though they wouldn't be able to perceive it. Uh, the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom wouldn't be perceiving or receiving the Christ impulse in the same way that we do. It's still present, but they won't receive it in the same way. They have kind of a different evolutionary pattern than the human pattern because they have a different consciousness. We're all evolving together, but the pattern isn't the same. Um, and the etherization of the blood, um, the etherization of the blood with Christ um, can change your form. It can heal your form. Um, it can lead to the regeneration of your form. It balances you out. Um, 
because it's alignment. You're aligning yourself with Christ. And so that allows you to literally just behave differently, which of course is going to change your form. And um, over time, what actually ends up happening is it's really more about, it's really more about, it's as though we go through this process life after life as we're still very much in this mineral physical form of our body we go through this life hopefully dedicated to christ in our heart and living that and what ends up happening is we begin to catalyze basically a etheric body we catalyze a etheric form that eventually rises out of the physical form and leaves it behind. That's my understanding of it is it's the re-etherization of humanity and the loosening of the etheric body from the physical body. Um, so when we were in the Lemurian epoch, we were sort of like an astral etheric form. And we were sort of hovering outside of our body. So we had like our physical body and we were sort of up out of it. And in Lemuria, we were quite a bit out of it. You know, we were just materialized. And, and then in Atlantis, we were sinking deeper. And uh, in Atlantis, it was kind of like our head was just out of the body a little bit. And then there was the splitting of genders and we began moving into the post-Atlantean epoch where now our body is totally sewn into, sorry, now our etheric body is totally sewn into the physical body. Again, in the Atlantean and the Lemurian epoch, the etheric form was not sewn into the physical body. Now it is. And so now we have to actually spiritualize ourselves out of the physical plane back into an etheric form and that's sometimes called an anthroposophy the re-etherizing of our form um, so what it looks like is that eventually we sort of loosen ourselves out of the physical plane and we create this sort of etheric body that's the that is the overcoming of all of our physical lives and it's sort of like the astral force. It's all like this alchemical process we're going through that creates this new, new uh, lighter body for us. That's, that's how I understand it. Okay, there is the symbolism of swords stabbed into the heart. Does this mean that it's part of the process to actually receive and transmute trauma in the heart? I like that. Yeah, there's imagery of like the three of swords in tarot or um, the sword in the heart that could actually mean the mind in the heart and that the mind, which is often represented by swords, has the power to destroy the heart. Um, yeah, it's uh, the heart is, yeah, the heart has the ability to take the trauma and selfishness and survivalism of the lower chakras and align it with God, align it with Christ, with correct timing, with intuition, with our higher self, um, and it could totally change us, you know, in, in, into the form that we've been trying to connect with. Um, and so that we need it to go through the heart center. Otherwise, we just end up connecting in our lower chakra system with our intellect and just becoming complete and utter psychopaths that cannot understand other people. The heart is not open. It's not speaking. It's just how, how do I, me, me, me? It's just, it's, a, it's, it's total psychopathic stuff. Um, and you actually end up turning into... A different kind of thing a creature of the night you know so yeah 
what would be the symptom of etherization between the heart and the pineal gland? Is the halo visible to the human eyes? I believe that the halos used to be actually more visible back in the day. Um, and they were known about, which is why they were painted. I think there was a time where we kind of had that clairvoyance a little bit more. And I think that's why they exist in art. Um, and uh, what is the symptom of etherization between the heart and the pineal gland? Well, the symptom is um, usually good ideas. And because of when you have that um, blood essence, etherized blood essence that's united with Christ, then you are able to have that essence go up into the head and it begins, mer it, it begins merging with cosmic forces. And because that essence is Christed in your heart, it can pull to you things that are beyond you, right? Because the heart is the seat of, of our connection to other, uh, other things, other beings, other, the rest of the world. You know, if we only live in the, the bottom three chakras, we're only living in an egotistical thing. It's the heart that allows us to go beyond ourselves. And so once we have that tuned, Christed, etherized essence that goes up into our head, naturally flows up into our head, we begin to naturally, through the law of attraction, attract um, a lot higher quality of astral influences in our life. And that totally changes the game because now you have you have very pure, high quality um, astral etheric streams that are going through your nervous system, that are going through your nadis, that are going through your spiritual channels and eventually going into your glands. And, and so your, you know, the, the, the symptom is renewal. Um, I think that, um, you know, you could associate it with you know, pineal gland opening experiences and things like that. Like, I think it depends on how used to this process you are. Like if, if you're just waking up and you've lived kind of a more selfish life, um, when you first start to connect your heart with Christ and etherize that energy in your heart and his image, it's like, you, this may be hard for you because suddenly your energy is running in a completely different way. You could probably get what are people call like ascension symptoms or headaches, or um, you could be, you know, confronting purification symptoms, right? But then if you've been doing it for a while and this is the way that you live, you're just getting into refining yourself more and more and more and more. And you're just going deeper and deeper and deeper into your own healing at that point. So it really depends on where you are in this process. It's going to be different from someone who's just turned towards this to somebody who is educated, knows the science, um, and has been practicing it, right? If in our present time, the heart is the center that attunes us to the sun and to the Christ stream, and at the same time, it is the place where etherization begins. How can etherization occur without Christ if the heart is Christ? Are you referring to a necessary, active, even masculine component of etherization versus an exclusively passive feminine process? Yes. So it's an initiation period. And we have a choice. There's a natural mechanical process of etherization that happens, meaning we have a subtle body. We have an etheric, we have etheric currents running through our body at about this level. We have astral currents running through our body at about that level. And there's a mechanical changing of basic substance into one or another that happens in our body. And it can either be connected with Christ or not. So there is that masculine active element where we have to choose to align. And we also have to choose to study this and to understand it so that our mind is satisfied 
um, this is one of the problems with dogmatic religions is that, or dogmatic Christianity, is it's just not really satisfying on the esoteric level. Um, it doesn't really explain that Christ is literally in the heart center, available for you to choose to catalyze yourself with. And that actually leads to your spiritual awakening. So again, um, the etherization of the heart is, of the blood in the heart is highly associated with the Christ impulse, especially in the Steiner teachings, um, because that is probably the most important thing that we can understand about it. So they have to be taught very closely together. Um, but ultimately the etherization is something that's happening all the time. It happened before Christ, uh, was born and existed. Remember I was talking about how even in the ancient Indian traditions, they would talk about meditating on the heart and meditating on the heart and meditating on the heart. And then one day you would build up enough energy in the heart and it would go up to the channel of the pituitary gland that would become charged with essence and that would shine into the pineal gland and open your eye. Well, that process has all, always existed, which is an etherized process, a general etherized process. But, you know, the real thing about etherization is that if you're going to turn the furnace of your, if you're going to have a heart center, which is a solar furnace, a solar alchemical furnace, you may as well align it with the evolutionary essence in the cosmos, which is Christ. So that you can evolve with it. So we have a choice whether we evolve or not. Before, before the incarnation of Christ, um, again, these initiatory forces were more from the outside in. We would go through initiations, we would receive cosmic rays from the outside, and that would evolve our form. But then again, because we've developed our individuality, we have our eye. We now have the ability to work upon ourselves, And for that transformation, we need Christ. Because Christ is the essence that brought all of that inward. But we still have a choice. We still have a choice. You, you can continue on the path of externalization, obsession with externalization, the material world, and that everything evolves because you're working upon your physical self and that weird impulse that exists from Atlantis and Lemuria, or you can tune into the transformed essence, which is that the kingdom of heaven is within now, and we work upon ourselves to evolve. And so it's a choice. It's a choice. It's not something that exists passively anymore. It used to be more passive um, to a degree. Um, and we're in a new game now because we have our individuality. Okay. Why do I feel very weak when my blood is drawn or I see blood coming out of someone. I don't think it's purely biological. Could this mean something else? I don't know. I mean, blood is such a powerful thing. It's why it is such a big deal in the occult. You know, like if you look at both sides of the occult, it was a lot of talk about blood and, you know, um, our, information spiritually on the soul level exists in, in our blood. Um, and uh, so it could have something to do with that. I don't really like it either, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there could be something going on spiritually. Maybe in a past life, you saw some pretty grisly things going on. And now there's a Ooh, like a, it makes you queasy. I don't know. But yeah, there is a connection with our blood and Christ's blood too. And maybe there's a natural opposition to seeing anything happening with it that's not of a higher order, you know? How can one create protection to the etherization process of the blood? and all the other processes to do with Christ consciousness within the body from lower entities who try to sabotage this very process continuously. Yeah, that is our challenge, isn't it? So I think that there's many different approaches that we can take in order to make sure that we are 
circulating the forces in our body properly, that we're staying on track, that we're staying harmonious. And I think the first one is to educate ourselves. Um, I think that there is this idea that we can kind of intuit everything that we need to know um, or that we don't have to study spirituality. We don't have to know exactly how our body transforms energy and things like this. That actually puts us in a weak position. We have to be really educated in occult physiology or spiritual physiology in the conversation we're talking about today, that actually gives us a lot of strength and a lot of power because our mind actually understands what is going on. And when it's educated um, and we do begin to spiritualize it with the Christ essence or wash it, as Steiner says, with the essence of Christ, we become just generally more aware of what's going on. So education is so important, which is why this conversation about spiritual science is important, is we're kind of beyond the phase in our evolution where we can have like a guru just tell us everything um, or somebody just imbue us with information, just download it into our mind. There are still people who are obsessed with having information downloaded in their mind from like computers. And there's still people really trapped in that old pattern. Um, and they probably maybe always will be, I don't know. But um, ultimately, by our own volition, by educating ourselves as much as possible on this material, then we can actually know exactly what's going on. We're more empowered. Um, and then beyond that, just having a, a, an awareness practice you know, make sure that your mind isn't going into all of these dark places. You know, um, one of the, one incredible thing about, um, that uh, I read when I was preparing for this lecture, it was in a Steiner lecture. Um, he said that to think too much is damaging for your body and it's damaging for your being. And so, one of the incredible things we can do is to try not to be thinking all the time, try not to be analyzing all the time, allow yourself to get engrossed in the activities that you're doing, you know, like the Gurdjieff work or the Gurdjieff techniques where you're just doing an activity and you're really dedicated to doing that activity. Um, that really stream, streamlines your energy, you know, don't fall into distraction. You know, the last aspect of this lecture was that Lucifer and Armon, which represent the basic two poles of demonic forces in our universe, they work upon the head, right? They work upon the head. So we want to make sure that our mind is, that we have control over our mind, that we are using our will. And eventually we will end up spiritualizing our mind, which means connecting our eye into God. So it, it's almost like we have our individuality, but, but we can think like the cosmos. And so um, we have to get our mind in under control and we have to be educated and we have to be, have a meditation practice. You have to take care of yourself, all of these things. The best, the, the best uh, defense is a good offense. And by taking care of ourselves, by educating ourselves, we end up being pretty safe, actually. Um, that's the best. I'm back. So um, thank you for your patience. And I'm going to continue on with the last question. I'm not exactly sure where it left off, but it was about karma and devolution and evolution. And so essentially, a lot of our journey in that, in that way is basically kind of decided before we come back again, and we evolve over time, transforming our karma and, and moving forward. So you don't have to consciously, you know, separate yourself from, you know, your bad or, or negative lives, you just move forward, 
hopefully transforming them by becoming more aware. And the karma process does this life after life sort of part of how we are. Okay. Okay, next question. In today's prevailing society, there is a phenomenon called cultural appropriation where criticism and censorship occur for adopting something something from a culture you are perceived you are perceived to be a part of for adopting a culture you are perceived to be not part of could we say that the transhumanist harmonic movement is the misappropriation of divine intent for the evolution of humanity or is it an expression of free will good question yeah, so a good way to look at Armon and Lucifer, they're sort of like um, fallen evolutionary impulses. So when we look at Armon, you know, we can see that he really represents hyper materialization, like materialization to a point where it's dangerous. And Armon is very frightened by, you know, Christ forces. And that's also why the Armonic stream can sometimes work with the Luciferian stream, which is the opposite of the Armonic stream, which is hyper spiritualization. And that is kind of like an opposites attract thing. So could we say that the transhumanist Armonic movement is a misappropriation of divine intent for the evolution of humanity? They're sort of like... Yeah, it, in a way it is. You know, Araman is seen, is probably the closest figure that we have as to Satan or the devil. And um, Araman is likened to the Antichrist. And when we look into um, anthroposophy, we see that the Antichrist has been given a lot more detail um, and modernized a lot more than in the past. And we see that he represents, you know, this technology, transhumanism, and really he represents this materialist impulse gone too far. But at the same time, that materialist impulse was what allowed us to develop an eye, to develop an individuality, to develop a body. It's what allowed us to form every single one of our organs. It's, it's what allowed every single race to form, every single culture to form, everything that's unique about you, about the world formed from this harmonic impulse in earlier times where it was just materialization. But now that's been personified in an individual, just like how we were talking about how eventually the solar Christ love force was personified as an individual um, so that it, it can interact with the earth and humanity directly. This was Jesus. There's also the Antichrist incarnation that is coming, that is Aramon essentially, which is total supreme materialism. It's transhumanism. It's genetic engineering. It's hybridization of the form. It is trying to evolve. The Antichrist impulse is trying to evolve the human form through external modifications of any kind. Whereas the Christ impulse is evolving the human form through inner transmutation and inner work. They stand totally opposite to one another. So in that way, you could also see Araman as like an inversion of what is divine, that misappropriation of what is divine or an in inversion of what is divine. He is the exact opposite of the evolutionary impulse that we need. You know, Christ is saying, you know, it's time to go inward. The kingdom of heaven is within. And we have we have this individuality now, this I. And it's time to use that to, dis to discern and to work upon yourself directly, creatively. This is the power that you have. But Aramon wants to draw people back into like a Borg system. He wants to draw people back into the past ways in which we existed. He doesn't acknowledge that Christ exists. He doesn't acknowledge that there's been a transformation on the planet because of Christ and because of the sun. So it's all basically just 
a, mis a mishmash of weird futuristic stuff that's based in the times before Christ existed. These old, old, old um, ideologies that come from when humanity was naturally interconnected that doesn't exist anymore. That's why a lot of people also associate the harmonic impulse with transhumanism and the Borg and being hooked up to this uh, uh, AI system. Yeah, well, that's basically trying to recreate with technology a past era of humanity where we were all naturally interconnected and clairvoyant. We're not, we're no longer there. So Armon is a regressive antichrist instinct that is a complete inversion of everything that is God, of everything that is God today and now. It's 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 out of time. And because he's out of time, he knows that or he senses that in some way. And he tries to use technology, scientism, to make up for the fact that he is out of time, to create an evolutionary impulse uh, externally, to compete with Christ's energy that we now evolve internally. So I hope, I hope that makes sense of the relationship between Armand and Christ in this respect. About two to three months of me doing your sitting in the power meditation, I noticed I would feel vibrations during certain times of the day in my pineal gland and sometimes in the back of my forehead. I would constantly feel a cool flow circulating throughout my body. Was this my blood washing my pineal and pituitary? It could very well be. Um, how the, um, the sitting in the power meditation is specifically about um, introducing a specific emotional impulse, which is awe and reverence. And this specific emotional impulse um, is known to work upon the body to open um, oneself to higher astral forces um, um, because awe and reverence is acknowledging the holiness within you. Um, and so... Yeah, when you meditate, when you meditate and you focus on awe and peace and those holy emotions, that automatically places you in your heart center. That is how succinct our system is, is that if you just had a practice of meditation where you were grateful, where you just felt love, you would automatically be tapping into this evolutionary pathway. You would automatically be etherizing your blood in the name. There would be a process of it that you wouldn't be aware of, which you would eventually probably have to become aware of to fully participate in it. But you would already be um, creating those higher energies in your system to lav or to wash yourself with. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very um, natural, natural, natural process. Um, the movements that say things like think positive and feel peace and things like that, those are just sort of very simple motivational, you know, ways to get you into your heart, to get you connecting with God. You know, that is what that is. It's all resonance, right? So absolutely. Okay, we're going to do two more questions and then we're going to we're going to call it a day. This next question is what happens to children who are special needs with autism or on the spectrum who can't connect with their heart center? Do they still evolve or devolve? So we're not all defined the same. So if you're coming into this earth and you're you don't perceive the world in the same way and you're, you have special needs or you have autism, you, you technically have a different perspective of the world and you're functioning a little bit differently than say normal people. And so you're only held to be responsible for the type of consciousness that you have in that life. So you're not going to be held into you know, if you don't understand a teaching, a spiritual teaching or something, um, then you're not going to suffer because of that. If, if, if you have 
um, if you're very drawn inward, like in the case with autism and, and some types of um, uh, conditions, mental conditions, uh, you're going to work within your condition the best that you possibly can in that life. And there's going to be certain processes that are sort of protected or that are natural within that type of consciousness. Um, and so it depends on the kind of consciousness you have. We're not all going to be on the same journey, right? Because we're not all perceiving the same things. That makes sense. All right. Last question. Last question. How conscious do we have to be of Christ consciousness and the need for alignment with it in order for the etherization of our blood and ascension to occur? I know many people who do not have a conscious spiritual practice, but are good people who act from the heart. Is it the case that they may not become conscious of it in this life, but will become more conscious in future incarnations. Yes, you've got it. So a lot of this, as I said, is totally natural to people. Um, this is a natural system. This is a natural process inside of us. And Christ consciousness um, in the etheric, everybody deep down inside of them knows that it's there. And it's only kind of like our conscious waking mind where we don't fully grasp it on th 3D terms or on everyday waking terms. But there's a part of us that absolutely understands what's going on and that will respond to it subconsciously. And so just like there's people that, you know, I know people that they they don't like religion, they don't like spirituality, but but they are but like nature and gardening and being outside is, and animals is like you look at them and you're like you are a spiritual person. You do realize that because the way you interact with these plants, the way you interact with these animals or these or these these children or these people is as though you're a holy person. You're acting from love. You're acting from compassion. You're acting as though these beings, these animals or these plants or whatever it is in your life, you're acting as though they're a part of you. So deep down inside, there's a there's an aspect of, of individuals that may not identify as religious or spiritual because of probably repulsed by many of the structures around these topics today. But when it comes to acting it out, they are more spiritual than people that attend church. I have seen this. They have more compassion in their heart than people who identify as being spiritual and religious. And that is the funny thing about our time um, is that when it really comes down to it, it's in your actions, right? So it's also the beautiful thing about humanity is that it's, it's, it's within us. And uh, yeah, you can act out of very Christed energies, out of compassion, out of love, you can be a wildly creative person um, because your system is very connected into higher forces. Um, uh, but it is going to reach a point in the next, I think, couple hundred years where we are going to have to begin to understand on an intellectual level exactly what is going on we have we're, we're going to have to understand what we talked about today we're going to under have to understand how the blood is etherized in the heart and how it can be connected with christ or how it cannot be connected with christ we're going to have to look at things that would be relegated into just spiritual topics or just metaphysical we're going to have to start looking at these things as seriously as any other topic. We won't be able to, in the coming centuries, we won't be able to push spirituality aside and have it be some weird thing. And that's why now we have to be preparing 
and discussing these things in more scientific terms and approaching it in a more grounded way um, is because that is the way of the future. This is the culture of the future. This is the spirituality of the future is actually understanding it and no longer functioning in a way where it's about stories and just parables that work on our subconscious mind symbols and being anointed by higher beings and having things, you know, almost pushed into our field and prepared by higher forces and things like that. That's our past. That's Lemuria and, and, and the beginning part of Atlantis. That's, that's not where we are now and that's not where we're going. And so we can be, we can linger in this in-between developmental stage of benefiting from certain processes that are naturally in our system. But in the coming years, we're going to have to choose and we're going to have to become conscious spiritual beings and conscious creators in our life and conscious participators. We're going to have to understand that the solar system is a school. We're going to have to understand human evolution as a spiritual process. There's all kinds of things within spiritual science that we're going to have to grasp. And that is what's going to def really define um, us moving forward is, is that process. So just to finish up here, yes, you know, you can be um, very connected to higher energies and, and having your pineal gland open and, and having these various spiritual processes functioning within your system. Um, and that can exist for maybe a hundred more years or so. But as we move into the future, again, we're going to have to um, become conscious participants in these and understand them. And that will lead to the evolution of our form. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me today. It has been my absolute pleasure to connect with you this Sunday. As I mentioned before, this will be going live on YouTube probably on Thursday or so. And um, this lecture does not replace our Q&A next week. I will be right here, right in this room, taking your questions exactly a week from today. So if some more questions about Christ and the etherization of the blood come up, in this week, I will be here to answer them for you next week as well, or any other questions that you want. And that's where we will end it today. Thank you again so much for being here. Have a wonderful Sunday. <laughs>